Hi everybody, this is the General Survey Vital Signs and Pain Supplemental Lecture. To go over some of the components of the general appearance a component of the general survey is you want to look at their apparent state of health. How are they presenting to you? Uh, do they look their stated age? Do they look acute or chronically ill? You want to assess their level of consciousness. This is where you're checking their uh, alert and orientation. Are they awake, alert, and oriented, uh, and responsive? So A and O times whatever number, three or four, depending on uh, where you work. Uh, or are they lethargic, obtunded, or are they comatose? And we'll go over some of these terms a little bit later. You want to look for signs of distress. Uh, are they in respiratory distress? Are they coming in with any type of pain, chest pain, or pain anywhere else in their body? You want also do a kind of a overall general appearance of do they look like they're anxious or do you look like uh, maybe they have or coming in for certain depressive signs. You want to look at their general appearance of skin color and any, any obvious lesions. Are they dressed appropriately? Are they well groomed? Um, and in terms of dress, uh, is it appropriate to the weather and the temperature of uh, wherever they are presenting? So for example, if it's 100 degrees outside and it, the humidity is 95 percent, uh, but then they come in with um, a large coat and sweatpants. That would be inappropriate to that weather. Of course, looking over their uh, general hygiene, uh, looking at their facial expressions or their affect, do they make eye contact? Uh, is it, uh, are there ch appropriate changes uh, in their facial expression? And is their affect, does that follow along with uh, their mood? You want to assess for any odors of their body or their breath? And just look at their posture. Look at their gait and any motor activity. Is it normal? Is it, uh, or maybe even hyperactive? When you're looking at height and weight, uh, we want to combine height and weight together in order to get the body mass index or the BMI. And some things that you're looking at with their height um, is their body symmetry. Is everything symmetrical? Uh, you want to note any body proportions and any gross deformities or obvious deformities. In terms of their weight, uh, do they look emaciated or slender, plump or obese? And of course, if obese, you want to look at uh, fat distribution over their trunk uh, upper torso and around the hips. When you're calculating body mass index, uh, calculation is here, whereas uh, based on height and weight, and we use this to classify patients um, as underweight, normal, overweight, obese, or extremely obese. Now, the concept behind this is we want to take into consideration the patient's uh, maybe lifestyle, their normal activities. Because if a patient is, say, uh, an athlete, so maybe you're working with um, a younger adult or maybe a professional athlete, just for purposes of uh, explanation. If their body uh, BMI is less than 18.5, they're considered underweight. But look at them. Are, are they um, are they well-nourished? Are they look at their vital signs? Um, just overall appearance and lifestyle and that can help you determine is it truly an underweight patient or is it normal for that patient. I mean just think going back to basic nursing school if you have a patient that has a heart rate under 60 are they considered bradycardic? We'll look at are they symptomatic or not. Um, same kind of thing goes here with uh, their BMI. Normal is 18 to 18.5 to 24.9 uh, consider overweight at 25 to 29.9. You have two classifications of obesity, and then anything over 40 is considered extremely obese. When you're going over the health history, you want to look for uh, any changes in weight. Is it rapid or is it gradual? Uh, was it planned or not? So any rapid changes over a few days might suggest changes in fluid, not tissue. Uh, looking at any weight gain, again, is it based on a medical issue or is it based on their nutrition? Weight loss, again, medical or is it from a, um, maybe even a psychosocial cause? Again, is it planned or is it not? Uh, looking at, at uh, fatigue, fatigue is considered a sense of weariness or a loss of energy, whereas weakness is a demonstrable loss of that muscle power. Again, you want to consider both medical and psychosocial causes for the fatigue and weakness. 
If a patient has uh, fever chills and, say, night sweats, you want to ask about exposure to any illnesses or any recent travel, both um, within the United States and abroad. And just know that some medications may cause an, an elevated temperature. Now, let's say if they were talking about fever chills, night sweats, and a cough, um, you might want to suspect something as uh, tuberculosis. But again, even asking about exposure and recent travel, just for example. Here's a question for you. A patient presents with a six-day history of rapid weight gain. The most likely explanation is dysphagia, excessive absorption of nutrients, diabetes mellitus, or an accumulation of body fluids. Key term here is rapid weight gain. And if you answered accumulation of body fluids, you'd be correct. So rapid, uh, rapid changes over a few days would suggest changes in fluid, not tissue. When it comes to vital signs, we're looking at the same thing we've been looking at our entire healthcare career, blood pressure, heart rate and rhythm, respiratory rate and rhythm, temperature and pain. When it comes to the blood pressure, uh, some common uh, educational pieces is uh, you want to ask your patient to avoid smoking or drinking, drinking any uh, caffeinated beverage at least 30 minutes prior to having the measurement. Of course, you want to make sure that the room is comfortable for the patient. Uh, you want to have the patient seated quietly in a chair um, with their feet on the floor for at least five minutes. That way, kind of blood pressure can normalize from the time they walk in to the time they sit and the time you measure their blood pressure. Of course, if the patient uh, needs a little bit more time to normalize their blood pressure, just give them that time. Now, a patient's arm should be free of clothing. Uh, you want uh, the blood pressure cuff and the stethoscope skin to skin. Of course, you're palpating the brachial artery, and then you're going to position the arm so the brachial artery is at the heart level. And you can do this by resting their arm on a table or up against, um, or you, if you're holding the patient. Just make sure you you choose the correct size and um, position of the cuff. Uh, if you have a, a cuff that is too small for the patient, it might be you might get um, a false high reading, and if it's too large for the patient, you might get a, a, a low reading, a false low reading. You can review this if you have uh, trouble or if you haven't done a blood pressure in a while. Again. You're looking at the, the point when you hear the first two consecutive beats um, when you auscultate, that's the systolic pressure, and then once that beat disappears, that is the diastolic pressure. Be familiar with the auscultatory gap because this is the silent interval that may be present between the systolic and diastolic pressures. So basically the sound disappears for a while and then reappears. So that's the difference between the systolic and diastolic. If you're looking at orthostatic blood pressure, you're going to measure the blood pressure and heart rate. Those two are important together. When the patient is supine, have them lay, I usually have them lay there for about five minutes. Uh, take the blood pressure and heart rate, wait uh, three minutes, and then have the patient stand up and then repeat the measurement. So a normal, normal orthostatic blood pressure uh, will drop slightly or can remain unchanged, whereas the uh, diastolic blood pressure might rise slightly, and that's considered normal. However, if the systolic drops more than 20 points or the diastolic drops more than 10 points, then you have um, orthostasis or orthostatic blood pressures. Uh, another way of doing this is uh, having the patient uh, supine, sitting, and then standing. But the two main ones that you want to have is the supine and standing positions with that time in between in order to allow the blood pressure to normalize. We know that normal and abnormal blood pressures uh, for systolic and diastolic, we want less than 120 and less than 180. And that's for older adults, uh, older uh, adults older than 18. Now, if blood pressure is elevated, a few things you want to consider. Repeating the blood pressure and verifying on the other arm. 
Uh, you might consider white coat hypertension or white coat syndrome, and that occurs when pa patients are a little bit uh, anxious just for being in a medical office or medical facility. And you can also allow the patient just to relax and then take the blood pressure a little bit later on in the visit in order for them to get acclimated. Another thing you want to consider is if a patient comes in uh, and they take their blood pressure at home and it is acutely different from what you take at the office, some things you want to consider. Since you know you're working in a medical facility, all of your equipment is going to be calibrated on an annual basis, or it should be anyway. The patient's blood pressure cuffs uh, may not be. So if, same thing, you would still want to repeat the blood pressure when you're in the uh, when they're there with you, but also you want to question their blood pressure readings, not yours. That might come up. We typically use the radial pulse to measure the heart rate. So if you are assessing the radial um, pulse and the uh, rate is between 50 to 90, and rhythm appears to be regular, you can just count the rate for 30 seconds and then multiply that by two. However, if the rate seems too fast or too slow, or even if the rhythm is a little irregular, you want to count for a full 60 seconds. Now a patient, of course, might have, uh, say, atrial fibrillation where it's regularly irregular. You still would want to count for full 60 seconds. Your respiratory rate approximately uh, 20 beats, or excuse me, 20 breaths per minute. Uh, you want to count for uh, 60 seconds. Observing the rhythm, is it regular or irregular? The depth, is it shallow or is it gasping? Or is it deep? Uh, and of course, observing for effort, normal or is it labored? The main points of temperature that you want to make sure you understand is that of course, the rectal temperature is the most accurate and that will be a, a roughly about a d one degrees Fahrenheit uh, greater than say the oral temperature. Uh, axillary will be about a degree Fahrenheit less than the oral temperature and tympanic about 1.4 degrees greater than the oral temperature. So average uh, temperature you're looking at 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and then you might have a diurnal variation uh, from 96.4 degrees Fahrenheit to 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit. When you're assessing pain, you always want to do a nice PQRST. So you want to definitely assess the location, the severity, and any associated features, uh, and attempt in treatments or medications, any related illnesses to that pain, and of course the impact on their daily activities. So the different types of pain, you might have a patient that presents with nociceptive or somatic pain, which relates to specific da uh, tissue damage, uh, in neuropathic pain, which results from a direct trauma to the peripheral or central nervous system. You might also have a psychogenic type of pain, and that relates to uh, the influence to the patient's uh, pain. So that could be from psychiatric issues, personality or coping style, cultural norms. So for example, a patient might might even report that they're not in so much in pain, but you, by observing them, you're seeing that they're, uh, their facial grimacing, they might be sweating, uh, just signs of, um, of pain, but yet they're reporting no pain because that might be a cultural norm for them. Uh, social support systems, whether they have some or not. And then you might also have uh, idiopathic pain where there's no identical uh, etiology to that pain. A patient presents for a routine checkup. You see that the patient's vital signs have already been recorded as a 98.4 degrees in temperature, heart rate of 74, respirations of 18, and a blood pressure of 180 over 98. What would be the most appropriate action related to this patient's vital signs? A. The blood pressure should be repeated at the next visit. B. Repeat the blood pressure and verify on the opposite arm. C. Check the heart rate again to see if it's regular. And D. Listen to the patient's lungs for adventitious sounds. And of course, if you answered B because you were paying attention, you would be correct. Repeat the blood pressure measurement and verify on the contralateral or opposite arm.